Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Movies by McManus podcast, the uh, podcast where we break down movies, comics, TV, books, whatever type of media you're into, in the context of who created it and what effect it's trying to have on the world. I'm your host, Greg. I'm with my brother, Mike. Hi, how are you? And uh, today we're going to be breaking down the 2020 film Capone, directed by Josh Trank, written and directed by Josh Trank and starring Tom Hardy as Al Capone. And uh, it's funny because there are actually a couple of Capone movies where Tom Hardy was supposed to be playing uh, Al Capone that actually, like, fell through. With different directors? <laughs> With different directors. It would have been, like, a totally different movie. Is that movie. a coincidence? Or? Um, I think it's just this is a character that, like, Tom Hardy's been trying to play for a while. Oh, really? You know? Um, but... Uh, this movie was not great. Uh, it's not great. It doesn't really fully realize Al Capone as a character. Uh, not a lot happens. And it's disappointing, one, because if you watch this podcast, you know I'm very much into the history of gangsters. Me and my brother both are. Uh, so... I was very excited to see an Al Capone movie. I was very excited to see Tom Hardy play Al Capone. And I was excited to see a movie that focused a lot on his later years. Um, It's an interesting concept in theory. The problem is it just like it sets, like you said in your breakdown, it sets up this one idea and then it's just that for almost two hours. it, It sets up this one idea and it doesn't go anywhere with it. No. If you wanted to do something like... Which the idea we, is that he's his. it's the last years of his life, which he is released from prison because he loses his mind because he basically has syphilis of the brain. Yes. Um, so you're just watching a person whose mental health and physical health has deteriorated to the point where he's basically a babbling, you know... You, well, I find it interesting. So I wanted... I like the idea that it was going to focus on his later life when, you know, he his body is pretty much fully infected with syphilis. He's very sick. He, his mind is like completely failing him. He has the uh, mental capacity of a 12 year old. And uh, just for context, so Al Capone, when he was 19, uh, caught syphilis from a prostitute in Chicago. Um, he hated doctors. So even though like syphilis, if you treat it early, is entirely curable, uh, he hated doctors. He never got it checked out and he wasn't officially diagnosed until 14 years later when uh, he's arrested and indicted on tax evasion charges and is sentenced to federal prison. He's diagnosed in prison after Capone gets a, a gets out he claims that the federal government uh injected him with syphilis that he didn't get it uh you know there's no real like anything to support that like that's just a gangster trying to make himself look better i guess but who knows if you want to get into conspiracy theories which we like to you know they were i never heard that before but i mean i don't know would that be beyond anybody the federal government at the time was doing experiments on uh, the effects of untreated syphilis. Uh, the cure for syphilis is penicillin. Uh, I guess, but you have to treat it early. Yeah. Um, like the effects that syphilis would have if it goes untreated. Mm-hmm. So if you want to get into conspiracy theories, I don't think it's the most insane thing that this was someone in federal prison who they experimented on. But I think it's more likely that he was 19, he went to a prostitute, and he just never went to the doctor because, you know, he's I a read that gangster he, he criminal. He was like a security guard at a bordello. Yes. So early in his... Let's get into the whole history of Al Capone. Which this movie does not Which this movie does not, and that's also something. Um, I would have liked... This is what I would have liked for the movie. You have an old, sick, dying gangster who's losing his mind, and basically he's trapped in his body, and now the past is kind of haunting him. He has to... They kind of do that. They do kind of do that, but here's the thing. We never see his past. They could have done... I brought up Godfather Part 2. There's never like a flashback. 
They could have done. I thought I was fully expecting them to flash back to his early career, where you actually see what terrible things he's done that are now haunting him. That now he's trapped inside his body. But here's and has the thing: to live I, I with. get what they were trying to do because that could have been like too heavy-handed. Like in other words, giving the audience like, you know. Like, and here's, you know, spoon feeding the audience. Like, they didn't need to do that. They were trying to do something more subtle, but it still failed. You know what? It's not an easy concept to do because the the way I describe it sounds good, but that could easily become like a Christmas carol. You could very easily turn uh, Al Capone into like an Ebenezer Scrooge type character Mm -hmm. and like hear the ghost from his past coming to and haunt just him. also like the other thing to say about how this this film was done is like you know the whole like looking back thing like that's been done a billion yeah. times yeah so i don't actually mind that they took like a different approach it just still didn't connect well they um, they didn't they didn't fully realize the premise and yeah, they don't fully like, he he's yeah. a very passive character in this movie Things happen to him. He doesn't cause things to happen. Except uh, for the, the end, which is not even real. Th- that's another thing, which in my 10-minute breakdown, I almost wrote in, about, uh, wrote in about the ending, and then I was like, I'm not even going to mention it because he he there is a moment at the end of this movie where he does, he takes a com- uh, Tommy gun and is basically like, it's symbolic of he's trying to basically take control of his life back. But that's not actually Capone, the character doing it. That's a dream that Capone is having. Yeah. So it almost doesn't even count. No, it doesn't because it's not a real. Uh, and there, there is also a premise of, he had stashed away $10 million somewhere on his premise, which the real Al Capone did. Yeah. He stashed away $10 million and he forgot where he hid it. Um, they never really... They never go anywhere They never that. go anywhere with that. They just bring and it up. They, a you they, th- you're thinking it's going to be... The, okay, this is the movie. And you're thinking doesn't. that's going to be like the MacGuffin of the movie. The big plot point. It's the yeah. big plot point. Is they're try- There's this stash of the money. The government wants somewhere. it and the gangster side The government wants it. Wa- yeah. wants it. The ga- gangsters are trying to steal it from him. They both know that like the secret to where it's hidden is locked inside this like failing man child. That's kind of interesting. They never go anywhere with it. No. And there are a lot of... They don't really go anywhere. They bring it up a few different times. That's something... um, then they have the, like the, the 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 young FBI guy who's like you know all like bright bright eyed and bushy young tailed. FBI guy who's trying to like that goes prove, nowhere either. No, he's in one scene, doesn't go anywhere, and that's kind of like why I'm talking about um, why I'm talking about to watch bad movies because when they do something right it stands out because they do everything else wrong. If you want to look at, like, how to set up a premise, Mm. watch this movie. But that's the only thing they do right. They set up a lot of great things that you think are going to become major plot points later on. Even, like, with his wife. And then don't go anywhere. You know, even his wife is so one-dimensional. Yes. Just, like... Damn it, Fonz! Which, yeah. by the way, they call Fonz to me is still Arthur Fonzarelli and always exactly. Will be. But like they they call his name's Al Capone, but they call him Fonz because his full name his first his name's full Al name Fonz. is Alphonse. So in, she's just in real life he went by the nickname Fonz. Al was like more something that the uh, you know the newspapers called him. Okay. But anyway, like his wife is just the whole time like, oh my god, Fonz! Like you, yeah. you're fucking up again. You're like for two hours. <laughs> Like the, and she's never even yeah. a real person. How about like a flashback about like when they were rom- maybe maybe she's sitting there and dreaming of like some romance they had. You never even get that. No, you never even get why these people are together. You never really get anything about like him and his even like his partners around him, except for the Matt Dillon character, which I guess he killed. Yeah. So the so Matt that was Dillon I character. I kind of liked that. A well, little here, bit. here's what here's what I don't like about it is that. Okay, you have Matt Dillon, who he's the ghost of a henchman that Capone killed. That worked for him. That worked for him, stole some money from him. But one, 
if you're going to do that, then it makes if you're going to do that, but then not show the rest of Al Capone's criminal history, it makes it feel like Al Capone is just sad about killing this one guy and not like the thousands of other terrible things that he's done. This should be a movie of a guy regretting his entire life, not regretting one guy he killed. And also, like, but, we don't even know why this particular murder is so haunting to him because even Matt Dillon as a ghost is saying to him, like, if I was in your position, I would have done the same thing. Which, if you're going by mafia rules, like... Al Capone didn't lose sleep over that guy. No, 100%. I I was actually trying to look up. So they call him Johnny. They never say his last name. And I was trying to like look up if that was based off an actual guy. Yeah. I, it's it's not. It's someone who's made up for um I was looking on like the Wikipedia and the Wiki, which just goes to show you how like the people who edit Wikipedia might not be great at it. They said that this character is supposed to be based off Johnny Torrio. And I saw that and immediately knew it was wrong because Johnny Torrio died 10 years after Al Capone. Um, well, why couldn't he die after? Oh, because Al Capone's supposed to be, have killed him. Yeah. Who is he? I don't even know who that is. A Chicago guy. Let's go into the history of uh, Al Capone. Yeah, sure. The one thing I'll say before that is like, this was our second time watching this and I liked it better the second time. I did too. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to mention that I like it better the second time. It's still not good. Um, but no, it's still not something that I would say is good, but at least I was like, you know what? It's a vibe. Uh, If you're going to sink in, just be like, I didn't mind really why I, I, I was surprised by, how little I actually minded. Like, when you told me we were doing this, I was like, you're really making me watch this fucking movie again? Yeah. And then when I actually sat and watched it, I was kind of surprised. I was like, I don't really mind watching this for some reason. Yeah. Even um, though still, it's not it, a good movie. Here's the thing that kind of... When I was watching the second time, I knew how much was left in the movie. You know? I knew, like... I knew how mean? much I knew how much time was left in the movie. When I was watching the first time, I was so bored and I was like, when the fuck is this going to end? And the second time I was watching, I was like, all right, I know I have roughly like 20 minutes left. You know? Yeah, I mean, it is it was real well, first of all, cuz also on the first time, we didn't know what we were getting into. Yeah. So like you're sitting there going right and i knew exactly like i knew don't expect flashbacks and i don't knew expect like shit. don't expect anything to happen the first time you're watching it you're going first of all the movie's called capone yeah like it's it's fucking capone and it's his face and it's a big time actor and then you just yeah. never get you that, get this like that's another thing you were talking about the like young hotshot like fbi guy um he he comes in there's like a half hour left in the movie and the first time i watched it i was like they're introducing this now like this is something that should have been in like the first half hour not the last it goes nowhere it It goes goes nowhere nowhere. all right i wanted to talk about just because i like talking about mafia history uh al capone was a neapolitan gangster so al capone was a (laughs) neo-nazi where are we going here When the Mafia first came to America, there was the Mafia, which was Sicilian, and there was the Camorra, which was Neapolitan. And the Mafia and the Neapolitan and the Camorra went to war with each other, and the Camorra got wiped out. Their leadership was was wiped out, and the soldiers who were left were joined in the uh, Dialacqua family. And the rule that they made was that Neapolitan gangsters could join their family, but could never rise through the ranks and never have any leadership position, which came into modern day because the Dialacqua family became the Gambino family, who wouldn't have a uh, Neapolitan gangster as one of their captains until John Gotti in the late 70s. So... After this happened, there's no more Camorra really in New York. So there are a lot of Neapolitan gangsters who are kind of operating independently and they don't really have like one group to form together to protect them. And one of these gangsters is Johnny Torrio. 
and he hires young Al Capone as basically like he's he's a tough kid, maybe like 14 or 15 and basically just a street kid to help protect his interests from the Sicilians who are trying to take advantage of him. Johnny Torrio eventually moves out to Chicago and ta- and because he realizes like I'm a small fish here in New York City, but in Chicago I can do a what lot. What part of New York City were they in? I believe Brooklyn. Uh, Al Capone was born in Park Slope. All right. Uh, so he moves out to Chicago and uh, he links up with this other Neapolitan gangster called Jim Calismo. And they kind of have the Neapolitan gang. And then there's the Jenna crime family, which are the Sicilian mob. Um, and they hate each other. And then when Prohibition comes around, Jim Calismo doesn't want to get into prohibition because he realizes like there's no way the U.S. government could keep alcohol legal for that long. But since the Sicilians are getting into it, uh, Johnny Torrio realizes that if they cannot get a leg up on us, the Sicilians always hate us. They always will. If they outbeat us at anything, we are dead. So Johnny Torrio kills his boss, takes over the gang, and now they're 100% a bootlegging operation. And he brings in Al Capone as kind of his right-hand man and his bodyguard. Uh, Johnny Torrio, there's an assassination attempt against, against him. There are kind of different theories of who started it. It might have been the Sicilians, it might have been the Irish, or it might have been Al Capone trying to take over. But Johnny Torrio decides to leave Chicago and go to Italy, and Al Capone becomes the boss. And kind of the first thing Al Capone does is he takes out the leadership of the Sicilians, and he forms the Neapolitans and the Sicilians together under what's now called the Chicago Outfit. And then he kind of sets off, he, ba- he basically sets a bunch of firebombs to basically any business that refuses to buy alcohol for, for him. He goes to war with the Irish. From um, him? From him? Any and basically any business, any bar that refuses to buy alcohol from him, gotcha. he sets fire to. And kind of there's Reasonable. like this campaign of firebombing all around Chicago. And then in the St. Valentine Massacre, he kills out uh, the leadership of the Irish gang. And now he's 100% in control of Chicago. Uh, eventually... Like because of the St. Valentine's Massacre, it becomes national uh, news. Uh, this guy named um, Elliot Ness, who's an FBI agent, is sent to Chicago to take care, uh, basically to arrest Al Capone. Elliot Ness is a complete mess. Uh, he fails miserably. He's kind of romanticized later on, but he was actually terrible at his job. He's in job. a lot of rap lyrics. For He's in reason. a lot of rap lyrics. He's not, his squad was known as like the untouchables. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've always like just heard that name throughout history. Elliot Ness is romanticized as this like great untouchable cop. Who's amazing. Like this amazing FBI agent who brought down jo- uh, Al Capone. In reality, he was terrible at his job. And the IRS took down Al Capone. Um, so then you see, like, there's actually kind of a, also during this time, uh, Al Capone takes out one of his old rivals, Frankie Yale, who is from Brooklyn. And uh, Frankie Yale's old crew becomes the Colombo family. So in part, he's also responsible for kind of creating the Colombo family. Uh, so like, there's kind of a lot to like work from if you want to talk about like horrible things that Al Capone's done, that story that I kind of just told of his rise to power, like you don't see any of it in the movie. Uh, and there has been like movies of Al Capone in the past that, that have kind of, you know, gone through that story of him, you know. His boss before him get a, a killing uh, his boss and then, you know, his like violent rise to power. So I knew the story of Al Capone. I knew that if you're looking at a gangster looking back, that there is like a long history to look for. Uh, kind of like The Godfather Part 2, where it's Michael Corleone 
you see flashbacks to like his father growing up in Italy. And I, I don't know. I wanted a more like, you know me. I'm this like, I'm not what this was. I'm I'm a mafia history nerd. Yeah. And uh, this you is know. an experimental film. Yeah. That thought too highly of itself. And that's we should talk about the director, Josh Frank, Trank. Yeah. So Josh Trank, um, he was 27 years old when his directorial debut becomes number one at a box office. Which was what? What, which, which was what? Uh, was Chronicle. Yeah. Do in we know how he got that job? Because to me, uh, just... his dad was like a big studio executive. Uh, and that always works out really yeah. well. And that's always the, the best reason of, to hire someone for the anything. The writer of Chronicle was a guy named Max Landis, whose dad was also a big studio executive. So hey, here's what we have. the land of opportunity. We have two kids who grew up in uh hollywood who they team together and they make this movie chronicle who i i haven't seen apparently apparently it's pretty good but besides the point the point is neither one of them really get success like that afterwards um max landis would go off to write like a bunch of really fucking terrible sci-fi movies uh josh trank Right after the release of this, basically, uh, so I remember this came out, I was in film school and like everyone was talking about it and everyone was talking about how Josh Trank was basically like the new Steven Spielberg, which like is never works out for anybody. Right. I, like there are so many young directors who everyone is like, this is the new Steven Spielberg. And there, it's, I'm just thinking of, there's an episode of friends when Joey's going out for a, an audition. He's like, Oh, I really hope I get this. This director's supposed to be the next, next Scorsese. And they're like, what? Like the next Scorsese? And he's like, nah, there's someone in like Chicago. He's the next Scorsese. <laughs> this guy's the next, next Scorsese. Um, uh, well, Steven Spielberg directed uh, at Jaws at 28. So that's the parallel. Josh yeah. Trank beat him by one year right. as uh, the youngest director to have a film at number one at the U.S. box office. Spielberg's like, all right, cool. You could have that. <laughs> um, My movie was called Jaws. Yeah. You might yeah, have heard of it. it. Which is exactly that I have to explain what Chronicle is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one needs to any explanation about <laughs> Jaws. Spiel, Spielberg wins that one. Um, yeah, you got me by one year. Okay. Um, but anyway, like he kind of gets a bunch of... Uh, he, he gets kind of recruited to do a bunch of pitches for other movies. Was and, Chronicle a Superman movie? I mean, not a super. It was you know, a superhero, a, a superhero movie. movie. Yes, it was, but it wasn't about any like major character. Superman movie. It was about kind of these like teenagers who get these like superhero powers, and one of them's evil. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I never fucking saw it. I don't care. I didn't. I didn't want to see it because fucking everyone was talking about this Josh Trank dude when I was in film school, like he was going to be the greatest fucking director ever, and like. This is some kid with a fucking dad who's a Hollywood executive who who was wrote a wrote a uh, made a movie with his friend whose dad's also a Hollywood executive. Like, I don't give a fuck about these guys. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about rich people. Um, you know, and by the way, if like you know, if, I'm not saying if they yeah. went and killed it, then yeah. fine. You yeah. know what? Make the most also, of your opportunity. Yeah. I'm not saying that that yeah. means you're no. automatically a bad director. Yeah. But if he was, if you didn't earn it, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so he gets hired to do this movie called Fantastic Four. Uh, obviously, you know who Fantastic Four is the superhero. In 2015, they were rebooting it. Uh, they were basically Sony was rebooting it because uh, if they hadn't made a um, Fantastic Four movie in like 10 years or so. And I think it was like if they didn't do anything with the property for 15 years, then the rights would go back to Marvel. Right. So they basically were making this movie just to keep the to keep the rights. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which. um they ended, they ended up actually selling Fantastic Four back to Marvel anyway, so it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. But a lot of things kind of went wrong right off the bat. Uh, 
some things are unconfirmed, but which, you know, I'll say confirmed and unconfirmed. What, what is confirmed is that he was he was fired halfway through because uh, he was fighting with the, the executives. Uh, apparently, he passed on 95 percent of their notes. Uh, and apparently he caused a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage to a house that the studio had rented. For now, what does that production. mean? He broke shit. Like break that down. I mean, cause to me, I just, I don't understand how that could he, even he be broke possible. shit. How do you break a hundred thousand dollars worth of shit? I don't know. Like, I've heard. Are you things, literally swinging I've, an axe? I've heard like, things that uh, he like let his that he had a bunch of dogs that were like loose and that they tore the house up. I I don't know, but apparently that was part of it. I I've heard it from like multiple sources of like it was a dollar amount of like around or over a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage that he did to yeah. a house. I mean that just on. seems difficult to achieve. Um, uh, how, so wait, you could speak to this being in the industry. If that whole idea of notes are are notes like um, expected to be um, implemented or what level is, is a, it, was it just like 95% you're, oh, you're basically telling us to go fuck ourselves yes you don't uh, I mean obviously like if it if it's a director's vision he has it doesn't have to do 100% of what the studio is saying are there but, films where it's like Obviously, if it's Spielberg or someone, maybe they have more leeway over the notes. If you're but a young guy like that, if might... you're Spielberg or Tarantino, you do. Yeah. But if this is a major studio with a major property and they're expecting and it's a you, legacy thing, if you're if they're expecting you to make a superhero movie, yeah. and you're trying to do your art house stuff, not gonna happen. You're gonna get fired. Right. right, right. Um. All right. I've heard this from, like, multiple news sources, so this is not just me making it up. Uh, apparently, he got into a, a fist fight with the lead actor, Miles Teller, uh, on Fantastic Four. Miles Teller, he's from Whiplash. Miles Teller from Whiplash. Don't know a single thing about the guy. Very douchebag face, though. Very douchebag face. Very Nobody douchebag face. Um, so I kind of... I'm on the. I got the director on that. One. Well, and then another thing was kidding. that apparently he showed up to set one day so high that he could barely talk. <laughs> Which I've also heard from like a few different like news sources mm -hmm. that have said that that he that he kind of had like an issue and he showed up to set one day he could barely talk and he got into a fist fight with the main character. Yeah, that's not uh, so good. Rooney Mara is also in this. No, not Rooney Mara. Kate Mara is in this movie. Uh, Relation or no? I'm not sure if they're related. Yeah, but Kate Mara is in this movie. Um, apparently, Josh Trank did not want to hire her. It was a, she was a casting that was kind of like forced on him by the studio and would not even like look at her or give her any notes throughout the entire movie. Um, oh, my God. Multiple things I've heard about this like guy Adam being Gase a douchebag, and uh, he is fired halfway through. The movie is pretty fucking bad, uh, Fantastic Four, and there's kind of like there's two. You watch two thirds of the movie, and then randomly it says one year later. And the next third feels like an entirely different movie. So it's like literally like a one year gap of like you can tell where he was fired and the studio took over. Oh, and it and the entire thing tonally is kind of a mess. And for the first two thirds of the movie, it is kind of like the Capone syndrome where they're setting up a lot of things that like you feel like they're not going anywhere with this. And then the last third is kind of like very rushed. <laughs> it's almost as if like the first two thirds of the movie is one movie. And then like they squeeze the entire sequel into like the last half hour. That's pretty funny. Um, so what are, what are some other examples of this guy's stuff? That was it. Chronicle, oh. Fantastic Four, so that's a, and then Capone. 
Oh, okay. So he hasn't done that much. He hasn't done that much, no. Well, after Fantastic Four, no one really wanted to work with him. He was supposed to direct Star Wars. Jeez. Uh, Oh, man, you really fucked up, son. (laughs) And he was supposed to direct Star Wars. How much money did he cost himself? And... After like an the financial punch. flop, after like all these rumors that kind of start circulating about him, uh, he was replaced. Um, and also, after like Fantastic Four was a, cri- a critical failure, he went on Twitter and like started bad mouthing the executives That's of, awesome. so- of Sony. Uh, he basically wrote like. I had an amazing version of this movie and these people ruined it. Um, <laughs> That's going to go over like, really well. I had an amazing version of this movie that no one was ever going to see now and like these executives ruined it. Um, That's awesome. So I talk about this in my breakdown of just... For, uh, that was in 2015, so he hadn't done anything for like five years. I guess he was trying to make this Capone movie happen. Uh, but you see like... Here's a director who he has a lot to prove. He really needs this movie to kind of be at least critically successful. He needs to this prove... This was neither, right? No, no. Neither. Uh, no. Well, we don't know financially how it would have done if it wasn't for the pandemic. And it was also sold to a streaming service. It was sold so to... It uh, probably did make money. Uh, yeah, Amazon, I... Right? forget what streaming service it was sold to though i mean yeah Um, it's on amazon already so that means it might have been just sold to amazon i don't know but um i mean i i don't even know because they might have it might be something that amazon will be giving them money like later on i i don't really know you know did you notice how many without a box office it's hard to tell how much money a movie actually makes so basically everything that came out in 2020 is sort of a wash in terms of like box office how does that work it it's hard to tell on a on a streaming site. It's hard to tell how much money. Um, well, they, the they, movie they're, actually they're obviously makes. quantifying it somehow because that's going to inform their decisions, right? But so that, you're saying somebody knows. It's just not necessarily public knowledge. Somebody knows, but it's not public knowledge. It's like Netflix doesn't really like. Yeah. Uh, Netflix hear. goes by how many people like watched it. It doesn't go by like how much money they made. So we don't, it's always hard to tell us without like a box office to report literally how much money the movie made so because what, people were going to theaters. It, it's hard to kind of tell. So you're saying it's not, we can't, the, 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 um, the jury's out on how this movie, movie performed. I'm, I'm saying that financially it's not going to matter because there's not really a lot of like you can't tell if this movie was in theaters maybe it would have made a bunch of money but there was a pandemic so it wasn't so that probably but we do know that critically it was pretty much panned that no one really liked this movie yeah uh but he had a lot he had a lot to prove and you kind of see like in the movie where the problems are with this guy of he wants to make he he wants to make godfather part two he wants to make like a deep uh, dive into the psychological being of a gangster he doesn't want to make a gangster movie per se you know and he, he wants to make like an art house movie he wants to do what he did with Fantastic Four, where they hired him to make a superhero movie. He didn't want to make a superhero movie. He wanted to make this like weird intellectual art house movie that had superhero, uh, superheroes in it. He didn't want to make a gangster movie. He wanted to make some intellectual movie that had a gangster in it, which is the problem because it doesn't come off as intellectual. It comes, it comes off, off as, as pretentious. Yeah. You said this the first time we watched it, because the first time we watched it, we said it together. Uh, we watched it together, and you said, like, how weird it, like, you can tell whoever made this, like, thought it was the smartest movie ever. Yeah. When really it is just dull and it is boring. And the more I'm talking about, the more I hate it. <laughs> I know. I, I just don't know. What, there was something about it that I I thought it was better the second time. 
Um, I don't know why. And by the way, I never, as long as I would have been alive, would have watched it again. Yeah. If it wasn't for this show. I, I don't know... I did like it better the second time, which yeah. is weird. I don't know. Because it's more of a, just an experience. Like, you're just kind of watching. Yeah. You're just watching something. It's not even a movie. It's like. No. No. I liked how some of the shots were. Like, I liked how I liked how Florida looked. Yeah. Like, I liked how the, I don't know, who knows if it was even Florida in real life. But I liked how some of the. I believe they shot it in Atlanta. Yeah. I liked, like, the water and sh- I, just, I liked certain things i like the idea of like this guy just sitting in his castle i like the idea yeah it had potential it just doesn't it didn't it didn't just hit. doesn't go through i don't Did i don't you- know if um because the the way i described it of like what the potential of this movie could have been is probably what like Josh Trank was intending. Yeah. I don't know if that movie can be made. At least not in 2020 where we've seen like, you know, a gangster at the end of his life looking back, you know. They needed more plot. They needed they needed to and do something. And they needed something. more plot. They exactly. didn't develop anything. They didn't yeah. even develop the thing with the kid. Right. Oh my god, I completely forgot about the kid. Like what's the kid doing? Like it, it, he's just in this room calling the house, but it never goes anywhere. It never goes and anywhere. And it's not even even if nothing happened, it's not even fully sussed out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I it's never dealt with. I forgot about the kid. That there, was there's annoying. So many weird elements. Like no one no one really gets dealt with. Like the wife, the kid, his friends. Yeah. Um the government like nothing it's all just table setting shit that goes nowhere it's true it's like someone set the table but then like nowhere. didn't serve food didn't serve food i like that analogy of it's like true. You, yeah um it, i think that's what annoyed me more when you um you know i don't know which i don't i don't know which i didn't like I don't know which movie I liked less, Capone or Gotti. Um, Capone uh, is definitely better made movie. I'm, yeah, than I mean, Gotti. Gotti is just a disaster. But also, well, all right, Gotti is a disaster, but... At least it tells Gotti, a story. Gotti at least tells a story. Gotti's another thing of like the God, the, the John disaster. Gotti from uh, from the first scene is the same John Gotti that we see in the last. Travolta is horrible. He doesn't he doesn't change at all. Horrible. Capone doesn't change at all. Bad like, casting. Better. You, there is Un- a story at least in Gotti, but remember how bad who, Gotti Junior is in that. And God Junior is terrible. But also like who who cares about the story if like the character is not going to develop along the story. Like, well, it's kind of like a beat by... John Gotti feels like a beat by beat of just a retelling of his life. That's of, what it is. That's exactly what it is. But it's like that character doesn't really develop along. We're not seeing, like, how this moment affected him to make... Uh, like, his kid dies, and Got it. it's like his kid dies, his wife said about it, Gotti is like, hey, stop being fucking sad and shit. We got to get on. And then, like, they never bring it fucking up again. And it's um, just like, all right, we checked up. Like, it felt like they were going through the list of John Gotti's life. And no, just they checking, were. I mean, because if you remember, like, off. but also Gotti, like, toes the line of so bad it's good, potentially. So bad it's funny. Yeah. So bad it's funny. Yeah. Capone does not do that. No. Capone never goes into like so bad. It never goes into like killer clowns from outer space yeah. territory then, of like it's so bad that you can laugh and enjoy it. Um, the fuck's his name? I keep wanting to say Ed Hardy, but that's a t-shirt company. What's his name? The the main guy, Tim Hart, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Um, ah. Uh, I, what what do we think about his performance? I, uh, not good. Nah, it's not, not good. good. I mean, it, I I don't. He tries. I don't see. He well, does, no, no. He I, does like one thing. But he, that, again, yes. it's like is yes, that the writing? That's true. Is that the, you it, know, it, 
I I His feel like it's it's one thing of this this character has one struggle. It's that he he's trying His brain to doesn't talk. Work. He's trying to talk, but he can't. Yeah. I don't feel like the emotion of this is a guy who regrets his entire life. I feel the guy who uh, it's a guy no. who's angry because he's like, I wish I could make full sentences, but I'm a fucking moron. I don't even think his brain works even that well to even understand that. Like his yeah. brain is fucking pudding. Yeah. You know, um, something. Did you notice how many production companies were associated with I this didn't. movie? If you watch the credits, you see like. I don't know how normal this is because I never usually... Oh, Redbox. Redbox was the... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure Redbox is what bought it. Well, Redbox was yes. in there. Yeah. But then as far as like produ- like produced by and like they had a thousand um, production companies, I was just like, what's that about? Like, is that mean that they had to go around to a bunch of different people and try to get financing from it or i didn't notice usually usually that's what it means that they had to get financing from a bunch of different people yeah josh trank isn't really someone you want to bet your money on apparently he Maybe. does have a new sh- like a tv show that he's going to show run uh with tom hardy as the lead character oh so um, maybe they're just really close for some reason maybe but i mean i like, don't let's redeem i can't or- I, I don't see why any studio would want to give that guy a second chance. I'm surprised he got this chance. That this is a third. This would be a third chance, essentially. Well, a, a second chance. I, I mean, because his first movie did well. Yeah, but then he, like, made But then he, like, serious seriously fuck fucked yeah. things up. Um, it, in 2015, like, the fall from grace of <laughs> the way, like the f- hipster film kids that I went to Montclair with talked about Josh Trank in 2012 versus how they talked about him in 2015. Just this sheer difference of how this guy went from he's a genius and he's going to like change the game uh, to just like, never mind. Turns out he was just like a pretentious douchebag who, uh, had a dad in the industry and that's what happened um what percentage of people that you went to school with are still in the industry as yourself uh that's a good question i don't know how many of them i still uh at least a good like 60 to 70 percent really yeah that's really fucking high it's a lot but all, but expected. also like i don't like communicate with a lot of them a lot. you're saying out of the people that you talk to i guess yes. that's the question i asked you but yeah okay that's way higher than but I also thought. the people i would be talking to are the people who are still in the industry yeah, so that's maybe that's skewed um i don't know i mean look i don't look uh, the film industry is rough uh especially like look we, I talk about Josh Trank with like a lot of judgment, but the fact of the matter right, is making right. a movie that's good is fucking hard. Yeah. It's fucking difficult. And you want so many factors. Uh, you want your movie to be smart, but not pretentious. You, right. you want your movie to have action in it, but not be only about the action. It's difficult. Um, and like people give up that's what happens you're working long you're talking you're, to a musician man and i'm talking <laughs> yeah i don't need to explain i to know you. about giving up um people give up people yeah. give up working yes, in the do. industry um they see the fact that like you know we work 12 plus hours while like most other straight jobs like you would never do that yeah um and People give up, and the fact of the matter is, when when you have a huge success at a young age, like Josh Trank did, every studio wants you, but they also want to they want you to be the version of you that they see. So, what do you, what do you mean by that? Of like, they they want you to be you know you as a director your vision but through their lens you know 
According to their rules. According to their... Yes, exactly. They want you to be your creative self, but according to their rules. Right. Um, But also... And yes, it's hard and it's unforgiving. Like you look at... He made one movie that everybody loved, but then he made one movie that everything everybody hate. A lot of other stuff was going on behind the scenes that made people also not like him. Right. But it's a huge fall from grace. And the film industry for directors can be a very unforgiving place. Um, yeah. And I but imagine. also at the same time, you are hired by Sony Studios to make a Fantastic Four movie. You you know that studio. You know who the Fantastic Four is. Four is. This was 2015. You know what mo- what superhero movies are going on at the time. You know that superhero movies are not art house films. Well, that, I was just gonna say, like at that point, you're 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 not necessarily a factory line worker, but you're basically, you know, you're turning out like. Here's how we make fucking SUVs. Yeah. Make this SUV. But it's like you're in that position. You can't be turning down 95% of the studio notes. Exactly. And if you're going to take the job, I guess the point is. Yeah. You know, you you should know what the job entails. Otherwise, otherwise, right. You can bankroll your own shit. You know what I mean? Go take that dumb big check, which I'm sure it must have been. And then go do some cool shit. Yeah. That's um. That's I believe that's what uh, Francis Ford Coppola always says when he's I mean, talking when he's talking about making movies. Uh, he goes, you know, I make one for me and then make I make one for them, meaning them meaning like the studio. Right. I make one for me and then I make one for them and then me and then them. And um, I, he, I guess he was just the guy who didn't want to make one for them. He didn't want to make one for the studio. He didn't want to listen to what they had to say. What degree of pushback is like acceptable? Because obviously you you can't be accepted. You can't be expected to take a hundred percent of notes. No, right? you can't. I um, I don't know because I've also never really been in that situation. If you're young, like I don't know, most of them. most of them. Probably. If you're young, if it's a superhero movie, most of them. Most yeah. of them. Yeah. Make the not all. you make the movie that they wanted that they hired you to make. Right. You right. know the, that's kind of the rules. Um. But damn, like I just really wanted to see a good Al Capone movie. Yeah, it didn't get it with this. I know. I feel like um. With the exception of, like, Boardwalk Empire, there's not a lot of, like, good gangster movies from, like, that time period, you know? Untouchables is, like, really cheesy, and it's the romanticized story of Elliot Ness, where Elliot Ness is this uncorruptible FBI agent who goes in and saves the day, which isn't what happened. Uh... Elliot Ness went to Chicago and made a complete fool out of himself. They said, like, Al Capone saw him as a nuisance, like, not as a real police officer. And um, he, Elliot Ness was someone who was, he'd be happy about how people portrayed him later on because right. he was way more into, he, he wanted to be a TV cop. He wanted to be an actor playing cops in movies. He would have news crews follow him to like busts. He would like say he would like. That's fucking crazy. He would inform the media of like, all right, on 157th Street at 8 p.m., we're going to uh, we're going to take down this uh, liquor shipment. But Al Capone had like informants in the media who would tell him so he would just make sure that like the liquor shipment would go somewhere else so like this this guy wasn't like this big hero cop he was an egomaniac he he also um he also afterwards he became the police commissioner of cleveland and accidentally set the city on fire (laughs) because um in cleveland like right after this there was a serial killer who was like preying on homeless men 
and uh, there was this big, like, basically tent city outside of uh, Cleveland. And Elliot Ness had the idea that he was going to burn it down because basically, like, if they couldn't congregate anywhere, uh, then the serial killer, like, wouldn't have as much access to, like, victims, which is, like, just idiot thinking. Um, but anyway, yeah, he said this giant, it. like, tent city inside of chicago on fire and it just like spread everywhere he like literally just like accidentally like burnt half the city down um so elliot ness was like a fool uh like when you talk about the untouchables you know it's very like romanticized story about what actually happened uh boardwalk empire is great uh it tells like a very like realistic story speaking Um, of steve buscemi i just watched horace and pete Oh, he's in that. That's the Louis C.K. show. So fucking good, man. Yeah? It's on on Hulu? Hulu. Amazing. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to watch it or not. Uh, You you could do what you want. I'm just telling you, it's amazing. uh, All right. I don't know if I'm going to do it. Yeah, he's not talented anymore because now you know that, right? That's that's how it works, right? No, that's not how it works. Exactly. No, no, you're right. It's not how it works. Exactly. Uh, just, be, just be honest about it. No, like that's one thing. I'm not, if you going, want, right. I'm not saying you. I'm just yeah. saying in general. If you want to say, hey, listen, I have a problem with this person as a person because of information that I know that I previously was not aware of, therefore I cannot partake. I'm a hundred percent. I get you. No problem. I feel that way about Woody Allen personally. I feel that way about Woody Allen. Okay, yes. but. You know, you you can't erase history in the sense of he was never one of the best comics that's ever I'm lived. Not that's say- just not I'm accurate. I'm not saying he's not I know funny. you're not. I know you're not. Yes. I'm just saying that you can't... It doesn't work like that. I'm not saying he's not funny. I'm sure Horace and Pete is yeah. hysterical. It's not It's not a comedy. I'm just, or just saying it's fine. Good. Yeah. But I didn't even m- mean to make this a Louis C.K. thing. Yeah, it, but... It, because it, Steve Buscemi is actually brilliant it, in it. it. There's a dark cloud over it. I get that. that. I respect that. There's if, a dark cloud over it that makes it less enjoyable. I, I, that makes I don't his, have a problem that. With that makes his stand-up, there's a dark cloud over it that, to me, makes it less funny. If that's your opinion, that's my I respect that. Yes. Um, I, uh, my point was Steve Buscemi... It, my point is, it's a brilliant show, and yeah. Steve Buscemi is a bril- does a Steve brilliant Buscemi performance is, in it. Because uh, he mentioned Boardwalk Empire. Boardwalk I Empire. I didn't even mean to go on a rant about Stephen Lucy Graham Graham. plays Al Capone in Boardwalk Empire. Correct. Stephen Graham Who, was was yes. um, Tony Pro yes. in The Irishman. He's amazing. Yes. Um, I was thinking about like there are no real great like. Besides Stephen Graham, I feel like no one's really like captured the essence of who Al Capone was. But even Stephen Graham, like the first season of Boardwalk Empire, Stephen Graham's probably like in his early 30s. Um, It's supposed to be the first year of Prohibition. And it's like Al Capone was 19 when Prohibition started. So you and you have like a guy who's in his mid 30s playing someone who's supposed to be 19 and he doesn't like feel like a 19 year old in the show. He feels like an adult man. That's another thing about Capone. He was 25 and was the boss of all of Chicago's criminal activity, which is insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was 48 when he died. And he was 48 when he died. Which is also insane. Like you're watching like this guy you know who belongs in a nursing home is in his 40s like yeah he um well he also was just looked way older yeah than he actually was even when I mean, like so did everybody back e- then, even when if you look at like pictures from the trial of al capone that does not look like a 33 year old <laughs> if you look at like pictures of him like at um you know, bars at, at speakeasies and stuff and like Looks going like around shit. town. That does not look like a dude who's in his late 20s. Oh, my God. No, no. Um, like in, his, in his 60s. So I don't know. Maybe always uh, maybe casting an older actor is better. But, you know, I, I never felt like in Boardwalk Empire that this is a 19 year old kid. No, that's yeah. I didn't know he was supposed to be that young in Boardwalk. Yeah, well, he, I mean, Prohibition was, you know, 1920 to 1933. Al Capone was born uh, 1899, yeah. you know, 
So so he's in his 20s. So yeah, so he so he's 20 or 21 actually. Uh which, you know, for then you're an adult male. You yeah, know? back then. Back then. You had grandkids at 21 back then. You had grandkids at 21. Um he's All an right. interest I've always thought like they they've also never got like the beef between the Sicilians and the Neapolitan gangsters like correctly and everything because a lot in a movie before in movies because a lot of his rise to power he's fighting against the Sicilians who really control organized crime at that point right and if you look for most of Al Capone's criminal career he wasn't considered like a mafia boss because the mafia family that was in control of Chicago wasn't Capone's family it was the Jenna crime family that Al Capone had their leaders taken out yeah he wasn't a member of the five families no no, he wasn't. Uh, well, but he later was, was that, given yeah. a position on, like, the original Mafia commission. Um, commission. So he was kind of brought into it. But it was before the five families even existed, right? Uh, before the five families. I mean, he family, was in organized. He, he was in organized yeah, crime way before, before the five yeah. families existed. The five families start in 1931. Right. Um. And he, he's brought in on the, like, Mafia Commission. Before that, in 1928, there's what's called the National Crime Syndicate, which it's kind of like a precursor to, like, the Mafia Commission, but it's more like a national, like, web of bootleggers who are all... Um, kind of communicating with each other to like make sure that shipments from different cities would go different would would you know arrive on time or stuff um so he was part of that in like 28 um and uh then later became part of like what is modern day known as the mafia so yeah all right al capone al capone uh watch bad movies watch bad movies watch terrible movies you know this movie capone like if you want to know like how to if you want to know how to set up a premise watch this movie because it sets its premises up good but then don't pay attention to the rest of it because they don't go anywhere no um and this guy sounds like a jerk and this guy, this director. Kind of, uh, but you know, start how to start the movie, how to set it up is a pretty important part. Sure, yeah. Um, all right, just this, learn the rest from somewhere else. This is, um, yeah, or or just like watch The Godfather. <laughs> Actually, that's bad advice. You shouldn't. You shouldn't like only watch classic movies because then you're not going to learn anything. Uh, um, all right. This has been Movies by McManus. Uh, if you like this podcast, you can check out our YouTube channel, uh, where you can see the video format of this is, and also, uh, 10 minute breakdowns that I do of each movie that we're talking about. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, check us out on Spotify. Uh, also check us out or Apple podcast and and Spotify. Um, also check us out on social media at movies by McManus. Thank you for downloading the podcast. We see the numbers. We see that you are actually downloading it, which was a nice surprise. Yes. Um, I'm very happy that uh, people are actually downloading this. Yeah, it is. I love movies and I love talking about them. So I'm glad that other people like to hear me talk about them. It's, it's very nice. Uh, check us out on social media movies by McManus. I'm your host, Greg with my brother Mike. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Have a good night.